I don't know how many of you know this, but that, the video that he showed was uh, Louis Giglio. Louis Giglio was maybe the premier speaker in the United States that traveled around and did different large conferences for probably 10 years. Not many guys get Louis Giglio to open up for them. I think we're all right here at Catalyst. Uh, I'm going to have to step my game up a little bit. Uh, like I didn't realize it was Louis Giglio that he was using, so I'm going to see what I can come up with here. But one of the things he talked about was like just how big we realize God is, and when we recognize the size, when we recognize um, how small we are in comparison, it's easy to miss the things that we miss, and we're going to point out that today. And one of the things I want to do today is I want to introduce you to a new God. Normally when you hear this at a church, you should run. You should leave the building. You should not stay there at all. But one of the things we like to do here at Catalyst is we want to make sure we are introducing the world to the real Jesus one person at a time, and we are being disciples who are making disciples of Jesus. And to do that, there are sort of three parts in this. There are your head, there are your hands, and there are your feet. And one of the things, like when we're all standing here and you're all looking in one direction and one person's giving all the information, we're helping grow your hand, your head. We're giving you knowledge you can use, you can take with you, you can chew on it, and then hopefully start applying it to your lives where your hands show up, right? And then if you're serving here, this is one of the things that you use. You can use your hands, and you're serving people, and you're caring for people. Your feet, that is done outside of the building. So I hope that you come here today, and, and we are helping to train your head, and we're giving you opportunities for those who are serving with your hands, but your feet we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, as the months move on, or as the sermon series move on, and we'll see that God wants to give us an opportunity for that. So we're looking here, we're going to be in John chapter 8 today. If you've got your Bibles, you want to open them up there, your phones, or, or we'll have it on the uh, scripture for, or the scene for you here. But we, have, we are looking in one of four letters written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. These are known as the Gospels. We're looking at one of the four letters, and one of the four letters here, we're looking in John, is written... Um, and what's going on here is these, I want you to realize what's, like how these letters came to be. Um, no one was keeping a daily journal. These guys weren't journalers, right? Like they weren't writing like, Jesus went out and walked on water today. Make sure to tell someone about that. Like they weren't writing these things down as they went. After Jesus left, I'm guessing they got together, the Holy Spirit was involved, and they were like, we should probably write down some of the experiences that we saw Jesus have with people that we had with Jesus because a ton of people did not get to experience Jesus in the way that we did. So they wrote down different experiences they had with Jesus so that we, thousands of years later, could understand Jesus and the people there could also understand Jesus. And these, when these gospels were written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they were written, they were written... Um, Matthew was trying to reach a certain people group. Mark was reaching a different people group. And then Luke and John, everyone tries reading, reaching a different people group. Like when you go to talk to your friends about Jesus, when you go talk to your family members, your coworkers, uh, people on sports teams, you're trying to reach them. So you're going to tell them uh, experiences you've had with Jesus, what he's done in your life. Also, maybe you'll remember a couple of the experiences out of here that you're like, okay, this one will relate to them very well. This one they wouldn't get so much, so I'm not going to use this one. And that's what happened when they put these letters together as they started putting those in there. And as they put those in there, people started understanding things a little bit better there. So we're going to be here in John chapter 8. To understand what's going on here, we've got to understand just before this, in John chapter 7, um, he starts going into Jerusalem, and he's there, and there are these festivals that are going on. And because the festivals are going on, there are just a ton of people in Jerusalem. So Jesus stays outside of Jerusalem, and he stays um, uh, and the Mount of Olives. Let me see if I can get here, okay? Uh, and, and to understand that, we've got to understand what's going on where he's coming from, but also to understand like uh, what these pe what John, the writer, is trying to do with the, uh, the people here, we've got to understand what's going on in their times. So all of them believed in multiple gods. The only people who believed in one god was the Jewish people, and everybody thought they were stupid. But everybody believed in multiple gods. So the people that, uh, the gods that they were believing in play into what's going on here. 
And one of the gods we're going to introduce you to today is Apollo. And we got this here on the screen, if we can get it there. No. Uh, okay. No. There it is. Okay. We're figuring it out. We're figuring it out. This is Apollo. This is what from Hercules. Anybody else watch Hercules? Hercules. Like, see, we watched that together. That was from a different one. Some of you guys got that. If you didn't, it's your fault. But anyways, we have Apollo and his twin sister, uh, Artemis. And Apollo, being that his father is Zeus, has all of these magnificent, wonderful powers. And these powers, one of the powers is um, that he brings light to the earth. So he's not in charge of the sun, but he drags the sun across the sky so that every day can start anew. He also is given the power of healing, which he gave to, to his son, Asclepius. So they got all these different gods, they have all these different powers, and this here, uh, when we're talking about um, Apollo, we see that this is the one that we're going to talk about today. Um, in Jesus chapter 8, he starts referencing um, he starts referencing what's going on, and he starts making these I am statements. And these I am statements, we need to get right, because Jesus is explaining to us, he's giving us insight into who he really is that some of us just don't pick up on, right? We, like, we think we know who people are from a distance. Like, uh, how many of the people, I've, I've seen interviews with people, and they're like, um, everybody sees me, they, they see me as this actor, this character, but that's not my name. Like, there are some actors that I've seen, they did such a good job in their shows that everybody hates them because they acted the part. But they're like, that's not who I am. I, just, I was just acting the part. Jesus here is telling us who he really is. And we've got to understand that what's going on because what he's trying to do here and the, and the, uh, the things that he's referencing here um, help us understand thousands of years later, but we don't completely get it. Like if those of us who were alive for 9-11, if I said 9-11 changed the world, if I asked you where you were on 9-11, you know exactly where you were on 9-11. 2,000 years from now, I mean, even just with the generation that wasn't alive for 9-11, it's not as powerful to them as it is to the rest of us. Imagine 2,000 years from now what they're missing so this is what's happening. Every time we pick up scripture, we're missing some things that are buried in the scripture that we should know, or that they knew, and will help us understand the story a little bit more. So Apollo was uh, Caesar Augustus's favorite god. He was the most important god for Caesar Augustus. He made Apollo's birthday his own birthday. He was like, my man, we're celebrating birthdays on the same day. We're going to have fun. You and me, Apollo, we're hanging out. So he makes it on the same day, September 23rd. We start looking. It's like, okay, September, that's sort of when um, some festivals, some Jewish festivals start taking place. And we see that this is sort of the timing is lining up for what's about to happen here in, Acts, or, uh, in John chapter 8. It's lining up with Apollo and his birthday and how important Apollo is. And he's the god of light because he drags the sun across the sky every day. So as we pick this up, uh, Jesus in, in John chapter 7 starts walking in to Jerusalem. He walks in from the temple. I, I, I think this gives you a good point of reference. I want to put up this picture here. This, um, this is a picture from the Mount of Olives into the temple. If you see the gold dome there, that is the Dome of the Rock. It's the second most holy place for all of Islam. Um, that is exactly where the temple was. They built it right on top of where the temple was uh, in Jerusalem. So you see, like, you can walk in there pretty easily. So Jesus stayed essentially right outside of the city, and he walked in every morning. So it wasn't like it took him days to walk there or anything. It took him maybe an hour to walk in there. We all walked from here, the Mount of Olives. We walked into Jerusalem on this day. So in John chapter 7, we're, we're starting the, the Feast of Tabernacles, or the, also known as the Feast of Booths. Um, they're trying to remember the people were out in the desert, so they were like, I'm going to build a booth. I'm not going to have all my water and electricity and my internet and no one? No one. Like, they didn't have any of those. That's why it's funny. That's... 
Okay, okay, like you aren't with me today, we're going to make it happen anyways. So I want to let you know, he's walking in here, these people are setting up booths everywhere, they're living out in their booths, Jerusalem is packed full of every Jewish person, Jesus walks in, and he walks in sneaky-like. He's a rock star at this point, and he's like, I don't want to walk in with all the pomp and circumstance. I want to just slide in and be one of the regular people. So we see here in John chapter 8, and Bella, you're going to keep up with me here and change the slides for me. In John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 12, and it says, uh, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows after me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So let's pause here for just a second. So Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is around all of these Jewish people. He is also around all of the Roman people. Everybody understands who, who Apollo is. Everybody understands we just celebrated his birthday. It might be on the same day. Like there are signs up all around, you know, the street posts and stuff like that. Apollo's birthday, celebrate here. You can get your trinkets, you know, birthday, you know, cakes for Apollo. It's absolutely everywhere. Apollo is the God of light. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, so many people are like, oh, no, he didn't. Oh, I don't know who this fella is, but uh, he's got it wrong. Apollo is the light of the world. I cannot believe somebody else would even think about saying that they are the light of the world. Jesus didn't do this accidentally. Jesus was there to pick a fight with Apollo, and that's what I'm talking about. That gets me sort of excited, right? Like he was like, okay, so so I'm gonna make some of these I am statements, and every time I'm picking a fight with a different God. Because I'll let you know they're one thing, or they can they they uh, say that they're one thing. I'm in charge of the light. I'm in charge of healing. He was like, yeah, I'm all of it. Uh, who's next? Who's next? So he just goes on and he says, I am the light of the world. We read this and we're like, we read it with um, hindsight, right? We read it already knowing that Jesus is the light of the world, obviously. So what's happening here is so many things that you start reading, you start understanding about scripture, you start realizing that um, Christians didn't invent this saying. They just stole the good stuff. And we're like, oh, I thought the Christians in Scripture was all original. No, they weren't even trying to be original. It wasn't even their goal to be original. Their goal was to be effective. The goal is not to be original, people. The goal is to be effective. And we have got to get this. Because so often we think I've got to come up with all of my own stuff all of the time. Well, how about you use the stuff that, that works? Because the job, like we're here to get a job done, not just to say, ooh, look at me. And if, we, if we're here to be effective, rather than just original, which is what everybody in Scripture is doing, it's what Jesus is doing. He's like, how do I best speak their language so that I can influence them and their whole life changes, their whole family changes, their whole community changes, all of the culture changes. How can I best do that? And he was like, oh, it's Apollo's birthday? Guess what, boys? I'm the light of the world. <sighs> got your attention. Like, Jesus is there to get their attention. Now that I got your attention, there's a few things that I would like to explain to you. And he goes on. Now, remember, he's there at the feasts. He's there at the temple. He's there in Jerusalem when everybody is packed. So the Pharisees were also there. So the Pharisees are the most well-known, well-educated people. As Christians, we have often bashed the Pharisees. We see that it stands out in our mind where Jesus disagrees with the Pharisees. Very often he agrees with the Pharisees. We don't see it because he doesn't point it out. But very often he agrees with the Pharisees. We just see when they disagree. So the Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass on no, uh, I pass on judgment on no one. 
So let's stop here for just a second. There's a few things that are like, should jump out at you. If they aren't, I want to point them out for you. So the Pharisees are saying, uh, in their law, you could not convict anyone. You could not prove anything by one witness. You had to have multiple. So they're saying, it's just you. No one believes you. He was like, aha, it's not just me. It's not just me. And he goes on here. But then um, he says, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. The Pharisees, the ones who were in charge of teaching everybody, making sure everybody was a good Jewish boy and girl, that they knew all the scriptures, which they knew so well, they did such a good job with that, had no idea God was standing in front of them. I mean, did, does that ever happen today? Does it ever happen today to where we're like, we miss when God's trying to speak to us? But I was at service on Sunday, and I raised my hand during worship. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm still trying to speak to you, and you're not listening. I'm still trying to use scripture to speak to you. I'm still trying to use your friends to speak to you. I'm speaking to you somehow from a voice within, and you're still not getting it. The Pharisees were like, they were there to protect and make sure that their people did not walk away from God. They're staring God in the eyes and miss it. Maybe that, maybe that just still happens to me every once in a while, not to you, but it seems like I miss it sometimes when it's right in front of me. Verse 15, you judge by human standards and I pass judgment on no one. Jesus here says he passes judgment on no one. Who will you see when you arrive at the pearly gates in heaven? If you're a good Catholic, you would say, Peter, that's what they tell you. Scripture tells us, Jesus. While Jesus is on earth, his job is not to judge people. After Jesus ascends again, his job is to judge people. So if it's not Jesus' job to judge people, is it our job to judge people? I feel like no. I feel like it's not our job to judge people. It is my job to love you, to care for you. When you ask, hey, Scott, what do you think about this? And what, how am I doing this here? I will share with you. But I'm not just going around bashing people over the head, letting them know you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. It's not my job. My job is to love you and to tell you what I know when you ask for it. Jesus said, it is not my job. To, I judge no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. So let's go back to Apollo here for a second. We go back to Apollo and Apollo says... Hey, I'm Apollo. Let's, let's have my birthday party here. And people were like, Psh, Apollo? Who's Apollo? And he was like, um, son of Zeus. Like, do you not know who my dad is? Do you not know, like, I'm sort of a big deal here. So if you were Jesus and you were fighting, you were picking a fight with Apollo, and you run into this, what would you do? But if I... Uh, but if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. My dad's bigger than your dad. Oh, I know. He picked a fight and he was like, my daddy got my back. Bring it on, Zeus. Let's see what you got. Notice from this point on, go through. I started doing this. Every time they're talking about the Father, it is everywhere in chapter 8. It is everywhere. Everywhere in chapter 8 is about how you are a good father, you're a good son, you're, the relationship is there because he's attacking Apollo the whole time, and he wants us to have a good relationship with the father. He's double dipping here. John is awfully smart. Verse 17, in your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the father who sent me. Let's see, Pharisees, why are you here? Oh, to make sure that we know the Father. Huh, why are you the ones teaching the Scripture so that we can know the Father? But somehow you've read a lot about him, but you don't actually know him. Have you ever met anybody like that? Like, they know a ton of Scripture. But boy, you can just tell by how they're living that they don't really know Jesus. They know of Jesus. 
Like some of you guys are sports people. I know Dwayne's got his uh, thing he does on Facebook and he like, he can give you stats for everybody in every sport. It's sort of ridiculous to me how he knows everything about every sport and whatever. No matter how I pick it up, he's talking about tennis. I'm like, shut up. I'm not talking about it. I'm not, whatever. <laughs> but he knows about all these people. He didn't grow up in the same house with these people. So many people know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And that's what they're missing here. Then they asked him, where is your father? Because I don't know. I'm only in charge of teaching about the father and making sure that everybody stays in line with the father. You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would also know my father, or you know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were being put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not come. So Jesus, Jesus is doing this not accidentally in the temple. It also tells us he was where the money was at this point. So Jesus chose the time. Everybody's going to be here. Apollo's birthday. He chose the place in the temple, but not just in the temple, close to the money in the temple, because there's some extra cool stuff going on there. But he does one thing more. He takes one step further because he's trying to make sure that all the Jewish people, all of my people, all the people I grew up with and I went to church with, because remember, Jesus went to the synagogue every week. He was a good Jewish boy. He went and he sat in temple every single week like every good Jewish boy does. He was taught by rabbis like every good Jewish boy did. Like somehow we miss that Jesus is Jewish and he did everything like they did. He did all the festivals. He did all the, uh, he did all the cleansing that they did and stuff like that. And then he comes up on his 30th birthday and he's like, okay, some things have got to change a little bit. But he wants to make sure that he reaches the Jews and he wants to speak their language because these are my people. So when he says, I am the light of the world, and he talks about what he's about to do, every good Jewish person, which is all of them, everyone knew the scripture. What they're hearing is, isn't it, didn't he just copy Isaiah? I feel like he just copied Isaiah. Did he just steal that from Isaiah? The answer is yes. He stole it right from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 5 through 8. And if you look at Isaiah, what is it, like 37 through 52, it sounds just like Jesus. There's a reason you steal the good stuff. Even if you're Jesus, you steal the good stuff. Jesus was like, I'm, like, what they're saying is not wrong. Why would I not just say what is already here in Scripture? Verse 5, this is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens and the earth who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all the springs that, uh, from it, who gives birth to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you into righteousness. I will hold your hand and I will, uh, I will keep you and will make you and to be a covenant for the people. And the light for the Gentiles, who's he talking to here? He's talking to Roman people. He's talking to people who believe that Apollo, he's talking to Gentiles here. All the Jewish people were like, no, we can't let Gentiles be in here. Seems like Isaiah thought they could be in. Seems like Jesus thought we could be in. And the light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison, and to release the dungeon from those who sit in darkness. This dude is doing some cool stuff. He's like, watch what I'm about to do, because we're about to have some fun here. Look, nothing's up the sleeve. Like, he is pulling some cool stuff out here that we just miss. Because if you look at John chapter 9... I am the Lord. That is my name. Not Apollo, not anything else. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory or my praise to any idols. We're not talking about Apollo. We're not talking about anybody else. We're not talking about Zeus. I get all the praise. And what does he go on and say? As he went along, he saw a man that was blind from birth, right there out of Isaiah. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the works of God might be displayed on him. So Jesus is there. He's referencing Isaiah the whole time, and then he's like walking, and he's like, walk with me. And he's walking, he's talking, he's walking, he's talking, and the blind will receive their sight. Excuse me, Mr. Blind Man, can I help you out here? And the Jewish people are like, you're kidding me. You're like, not only did he quote from Isaiah, he's doing exactly what Isaiah said he would do. Here's your sign. I am the living God. I am the light. I am the bread. I, I am all of these things. And we miss it. Oh, Jesus is the light of the world. Keep going. I've got to get through my chapter. I've got to make sure I get this today. And it's like, oh, there's so much goodness packed in here. So much goodness packed in here. To open the eyes that are blind. See, there's so many meanings here, right? So many meanings. All the Jewish people got what he was talking about because their eyes had become blind. They were so focused on the scripture that they missed the God who was behind the scripture. And for those of us sitting here 2,000 years later to open the eyes that are blind. Yeah, I grew up. We come here on Sunday mornings. I have a Bible. I read it from time to time. He's like, but you're missing who I am. You're missing the power. You know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. To, to free the captives from prison, which can be us so often. To release us from the dungeon and those who sit in darkness. Some of you have heard these things so many times that you, that you tune out. You don't put any effort in all week long and you wonder why. Why don't I see you, God? Why don't I hear your voice anymore, God? It's because we're in darkness so often. Jesus has been revealing himself from the Old Testament before they even knew he was coming. And then he shows up and he's like, Ooh, remember over there? Yeah. When I was younger, uh, my brother and I, Brad, we spent a bunch of time at my grandparents' house. I mean, we stayed there. We had our own bedrooms. We had our own dresser drawers. We had everything else. And it was a, like a three bedroom, a bath and a half townhouse. And we would go upstairs and my grandfather had the TV room, right? Like that's where the man was. Like you had two recliners, there weren't any couches. There, were, there was no colorful things in there. And thinking back now, there was a picture of like my great-great-grandfather, like a war picture. I'm like, oh, this was his man room. Oh, yes, this was great. So we would stay over there. And the older I get, the more I realize this. He's like, Scott, can you run downstairs and grab us some ice cream? Or can you run downstairs? Like I got my girls now. I forgot my phone upstairs. Can you run upstairs? Because you do it a little bit better than I do these days, right? So I would get to the stairs, and at how these were set up, like most of our houses, you had to light the bottom, top and bottom of the stairs, and it lit the stairs, and you're like, okay, I'm good. And as I would turn on the light, and it light the stairs, as I got further towards the bottom of the stairs, the light for the dining room was on the other side of the dining room. That's a dirty trick for a kid who's maybe eight years old and doesn't want to admit that he's afraid of the dark, right? Like, it's like, as I got closer to the bottom of the stairs, like, the speed picked up a little bit. It was like, oh, I'm going great. Now I'm going. I'm, you know, i got to get to the other side of the room before anything gets me in the darkness, right? And I bring this stuff back upstairs, and one time my grandfather was like, Scott, are you afraid of the dark? Um, and see, what had happened was that, um, like, no one wants to admit this. And my grandfather, looking back now, like, I realized what he was doing then. He was like, I'm still afraid of the dark. Man went through World War II, was raised by parents from the Great Depression. It's like, I'm still afraid of the dark. And some of you are here today and you're sitting in the darkness and you know it. And you've got to do something about it. You've got it. You need the light of the world who has always been the light of the world, who is the light of the world and the universe. Some of you are sitting here today and you don't know that you're in the darkness because I'm checking my boxes and I'm doing the right things. And you know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. And maybe it's time for you to do something about that. One of the things we do here at Catalyst is um, uh, we do baptisms. 
This is, it seems like when I look at scripture, this seems to be the point where, where God decides, I'm going to come live inside of you. I'm going to clean up all of the mess. And I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in there to take up all the room so all the rest of the mess can't come back. Here in a couple of weeks, we've got a, we've got a pool party planned. Or if you want to do it earlier than that. If you're like, you know what? I haven't been baptized for whatever reason. Or somebody else chose it for me or whatever it was. I'd love to talk to you about being baptized. I'd love to talk to you about getting to know who Jesus is. Getting to know Jesus rather than just getting to know his facts, his stat cards, right? Because it's so hard, like, I've been in these places, as a minister, I've been in the places to where I know Jesus as well as anybody. I know about Jesus as well as anybody, but I haven't been spending the time. I haven't been spending the time with him, not worshiping, not praying, not serving. I spent so much time reading that I fell in love with the scripture and not the God behind it. And for some of you, you need to get to know the scripture because you don't know it. For some of you, you need, you know all the scripture, you need to get back to knowing Jesus. You need to start taking the steps towards him, not just because that's what you do. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing a song here about this. And if you want to come pray, if you want to talk to me in the back. You can, on your connection card, you can put something in, whatever you want to do. We want to be able to take care of you. The staff and the elders are here for you. Whatever we can do to get you back in relationship with Jesus, not just knowing about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your time, for coming and picking fights, for letting us love you one-on-one -on -one as a group. Make yourself known to us as we sing along, as we serve, as we give, as we study, as we pray. Make yourself known to us. Come get us when we forget to run towards you. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.